spirited practice. Uh, I think the, the guys are really into football right now. They're eight, eight up with football. And so from the time they report uh, in the facility, the meetings, the weightlifting sessions, uh, out at practice, uh, the guys are just really doing an excellent job of staying riveted on football, taking it serious, getting after each other, holding each other accountable. There's just a lot of energy right now. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. We'll start with a question from Darnell. Hey, the big guys have been playing a lot of people on defense in their regular rotation. What is the substitution plan when you go into a game? Um, do you plan on playing a certain number of guys, certain number of reps? How does that get determined? Well, every game is really flexible that way. That's a, that's a, a difficult question to ask or to answer. Um, in general, I would say the idea is, is to go in and play the, the number ones. So those who we've identified as, as the top players at their position, we want to play them as much as possible. With the caveat being that, uh, you know, once a, a, per, a player's snap count gets above 60, there becomes, I think, a little bit of uh, an issue for fatigue. And if not fatigue in that game, certainly over the course of the season, um, there, if a player is playing 60 snaps week in and week out. And so uh, we try to uh, continually evaluate how the tempo of the game is going, how many plays that we've played at the end of the first quarter, how many plays that we've played at the half, and make sure that we keep guys on track. Now, at each position, we, we might have a 1A and a 1B, and so the rotation might be different, of course, at those positions. We might be looking to get an equal, equal number of reps, and I've got a couple of positions where I feel like, you know, the guys should be playing, uh, for example, five snaps for one guy for every two of the other, and then we leave it up to those guys to, to be responsible about leaving it all out on the field and substituting each other in and out. Okay, thank you. We'll take a question from Mitch Harper and then Jay Ketch. Yeah, Ed, what, what do you feel has been the, at least on the defensive side, one of the biggest reasons for this early season success? Um, yeah, so I'm going to answer the biggest, the biggest reason I feel like. The biggest reason is the, the team play right now. The, the offense is putting the opponent's offense. Our offense is putting the opponent's offense in a position where they have to strain to score, where they have to be aggressive in their schemes. And uh, so we've been able to get into some more predictable uh, pass situations at times where we feel like we can get after the passer. And sometimes that's, that's schematic. You know, when you try to be aggressive and get after the passer, sometimes that's, that's more uh, turning it loose individually out of position. And, uh, you know, I think the, the synergy right now that's going on with the whole team, the fact that we've been able to get you know, a halftime lead um, and, and basically put the other team behind uh, the eight ball, I think has allowed both our offense and defense to, to then jump and thrive into some aggressive situations. What value do you feel uh, is there for the program when you're see receiving all this national attention and headlines? What, what value does that give the program, you think? It's, uh, it's really just a change in, in obstacles. It's a change of, of challenges. Uh, when a team is – is losing or disappointed or, or down at any point in the season, the challenge for the coaches becomes um, to, to, get the, to keep them believing in themselves. And, um, you know, we have the opposite issue right now. I, I think our guys very much believe in themselves, and, and we have to do a great job of making sure that our guys understand that every team is good, every team is capable of beating the Cougars. We can, be, we can, we can beat any team out there and any team can beat us. And that's, that's the message that just, you know, whether you're winning or losing, it always has to be uh, sold to the players. And I think the, which, which type of salesmanship we need to use in those situations is what changes right now. Coach, we just heard you mention that you guys have a 60 snap, I guess what you call limit or a re recommendation. Is that a newer thing in this sport? Is it something you guys have seen with sports science? What caused you guys to settle on that number? Yeah, well, that's a great question. So like when I was playing, we didn't have games that went above 60 snaps. You, you might have one a year or something like that. Um, but the game has changed. And uh, when, I think when teams started to really run tempo for tempo's sake offense, you see teams now running, running tempo even if, they're, even if they're behind, even if they're outmatched. And they're, they're just trying to run as many plays on offense as they can, uh, not necessarily in an effort to win, but in an effort to do what they've set out to do, which is run as many plays as they can. Uh, winning is, you know, a byproduct of doing it correctly, I guess they would say. Uh, since that philosophy has, has really uh, transcended throughout football of, of at least changing up the tempo and going fast when possible, 
I think at that time, all coaches started to look at, at what point are our players wearing down? And, and sometimes, you know, that 60 snaps is uh, a very uh, generic model over the course of a game. But what I've seen is that sometimes uh, if, if an offense is putting together several drives back to back and our offense happens to stall out, then it, it might just be a matter of playing too many snaps in a quarter. And so at that point, maybe we're looking at 15 snaps in a quarter being, being too many snaps. We've seen your defense. You work mainly with the linebackers. We have names like Cinco and Jack and all these different names. What went into those different names? Do they have specific designations, or do you guys just have guys set at different spots and then you put them on the field? Again, again, I think the, the answer to that question – I. I think some of those have gotten some attention with, with our team because we, we actually put it out there on a depth chart. And part of the reason for that is we have a lot of returning guys who have contributed, made significant contributions in the past, and we want to recognize them for the roles that they do play. But, you know, when, when offenses uh, a couple of decades ago now started to really go from, from one or two personnel groups to five or six personnel groups per team, and then and not only that, but just more varied formations, as the video – technology within the sport has grown and the ability for us to get uh, not just a printed uh, paper stapled scouting report out to our players, but now we can, we can feed them loads more information than we used to. And I think that what you see in that depth chart for us is just probably what every, every defense is doing now. It, it, we no longer can say, I don't think you're going to find any team in college or professional football. That's just a four, three defense or just a three, four defense or has three linebackers on the field or all the time, or, or five DBs, or four DBs. It just, there's so many changes and nuances within each defensive system, and I think we just probably have been more out front about sharing that. Okay, we'll take a question from Sean Walker, and then Mitch Harper. Yeah, Coach, um, I, I was actually wondering something kind of similar to that, and, and I'm going to try to stick general, because I know you wouldn't want to get into specifics about this anyways. Um, but when you're looking at a team that has the possibility of, of defending multiple quarterbacks, is there, is, is there maybe a point where you, you guys kind of start preparing just for like generic, the generic offense, the overall flow of the offense, rather than like the particular guy or number that's leading that offense kind of thing? Um, quite, quite the opposite. Uh, we, we don't prepare generically. We, we prepare for each quarterback. And so when there are, like this week, for example, there's a high likelihood that we can't predict the starting quarterbacks for the opponent. They're just, they're, you know, they've, they've shown multiple guys at this point. They're dealing with some injuries. So we have to prepare for each quarterback. Now, to your question, if, if some of the quarterbacks have similar skill sets uh, and we see that showing up on video and with the schemes that they run, then, then that defensive plan would transcend be, between those two quarterbacks, for example. But we always have to prepare for the starting quarterback, what we feel like would be some of the, our preferred calls, and then the backup quarterback, um, and, and, and in many cases, the third team quarterback. And oftentimes, it, it's really a weekly exercise. We very often are going back and watching high school highlight tapes to figure out you know, what, the, what the talents and abilities of some of those down the line depth chart, depth chart quarterbacks are. Ed, with that, uh, that snap count conversation you had earlier, I, looking at my count, I, 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 by my count, again, it could be wrong here, but Zane and Troy Warner, two highest in terms of snaps this year, maybe speak to the significance that they hold on this defense on the back end and those safety spots. They do. That's a, that's a ton of experience back there. Uh, Kavika Fanua is another one that we, that we uh, consider as a safety, but as, you, as you've probably seen, He's been playing linebacker and nickel, and he's been carrying the ball at running back as well and giving us some depth over there. So, you know, we, if there was, were any issues at, at the safety position, then Kabika might be another guy that, that could fill in there. Those three guys together, the number of games that they've started, the number of tackles that they've made, interceptions, passes broken up, number of checks and calls over their, over their time and experience, they, just, they offer us a, a huge benefit back there. How, how nice has it been, too, from a personnel standpoint, to be able to uh, play guys and not have to worry about eligibility, red shirts, and just kind of have that comfort knowing everyone can play if need be, and you guys have had the opportunity to give a lot of snaps to some young guys with these wide margins that you've been having in the fourth quarter. Great point. It's one of the, one of the uh, silver linings of all of these 
COVID challenges that we're dealing with, that that challenge really was taken away as far as having to, to determine whether or not this year would be a redshirt year or a senior year. We're, our players have just really been able to, and coaches have really been able to look at the season for what it's worth and to attack at full speed. And, you know, whatever, whatever COVID measures and challenges there are, that's not one of them right now. Hey, thanks, Coach. We'll take one more question from Jay Drew. Hey, Ed, I wanted to ask you about recruiting Ryan Rico and uh, basically offering a scholarship to a punter, which is, was, isn't that common, I guess. What stood out about him, and what do you recall from his recruitment and getting him to BYU? The first thing about uh, uh, Ryan, you, you hit the nail on the head, Jay. We don't, we don't often have uh, scholarships that we can go out and recruit specialists with. The, the typical pattern for at most, at most universities, unless you're desperate for one, is that they come in and earn a spot and the starting guy gets awarded with a scholarship. But in Ryan's case, we liked him as a, a tight end, as a defensive end. He's a multi-sport athlete in high school as well, really good basketball player in, in Washington. And um, so we offered him as an athlete. And this was very early in the, in the time that we were here. And we had a few more uh, scholarship spots in that athlete category. We don't do that quite as much anymore. And then, you know, just with how recruiting went and, from the time that he committed and went on a mission and came back, we felt like, you know, his, his longest runway for him personally was at punter. And we felt like that would be the best help for the team.